on this episode of Conversations with Rich Bennett. What are some of the common mistakes that writers make when attending a conference? I think the biggest mistake, and this is something I normally will point out in all my classes, is do not take anything as law. <laughs> because everyone has different ways of writing and stuff, mm-hmm. and somebody can share their method and say, this is how you should do something. And there's always an exception to the rule. And sometimes it's not going to fit. So you really have to take take in all the information and figure out what works for you. And that's what you want to walk away with. The mistake that I see at conferences is people being too kind of targeting ed- editors and agents. Like they will, ah. you know, that's their sole purpose is I'm going to find one and sit down and pitch to them. And so they'll get them in the elevator and they'll pitch to them and True story. I know the editor that's happened to, mm-hmm. she, she went in the restroom and somebody slid their proposal under the stall to give to her in the restroom. Coming to you from the Freedom Federal Credit Union Studios, Harford County Living presents Conversations with Rich Bennett. Come on, you're faster than me. Oh man, you already on. said it. I was gonna ask her. She remembered the dates. <laughs> One of my co-hosts decided. She goes, Rich. We have we did the authors roundtable. Now we have to do one about writing conferences. Yes. And of course, I said. Danny, you're the boss, whatever you want to do. Sure. <laughs> we'll we'll yes. do. Because yes. she, you, well, you haven't given me a bad idea yet. Ah, uh, <laughs> so, no. Yeah, no. Actually, Writing conferences is but good. But I'm going to have a challenge. I'm going to have a challenge for you after Uh-oh. this one. Oh, no. Well, the author's roundtable in person went good. The roundtables I did on mental health and addiction went good. So I just recorded a virtual round table on mental health. Oh, cool. Which went really good. Yeah. So I'm thinking maybe after, well, the yeah. other authors round table we're doing in person, but why not do one virtually with different sure. authors from around the country? Oh yeah. I could hook you up with a lot of authors. Oh, what? yeah. I just had another one on this morning before, before this yeah. one. Yeah. Um, no, I've got tons of writer friends who I'm sure would love to be in on a round table. So just figure out a date and what, you know, it's going to be solely about conferences or what you want it to be about. And we can get uh sign up on and get as many people as okay. you'd like. So sounds good. Sounds good to me. So we are yes. joined today by Tracy Abramson and, and we're going to talk about writer conferences. So um actually, Danny, I'm probably going to pass it on over to you mm-hmm. since you're the expert in this and you've actually held some, haven't you? Yes. Or that, well, helped. is a retreat the same thing? Uh, so that's a good question. So writing retreats are set up a little different. Um, okay. Writing retreats have classes that are taught the same as you would at a conference, but it's a, mm-hmm. a much more intimate group. For example, my writing retreats, I cap at eight people, and we rent this beautiful house up in Bird in Hand, PA, and we stay at the house the whole time. So we get to have fellowship okay. time. We have all our meals together. Um, but there are, you know, probably 10 lessons they get throughout the whole thing and then one-on-one meetings. So it's almost like a mini conference in kind of okay. a nutshell. So uh, it's definitely different in some ways, but also there are things that are similar as well. Okay, gotcha. And and actually, I should have done this first. I'm sorry, because anybody that listens to the podcast knows who you are, Danny. At least they better. <laughs> oh uh, dear. But Tracy, if you <laughs> if you can, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself. How many how many books have you written? Okay, I'm somewhere in the forty to fifty range. You've written forty to fifty books. I think I'm writing like fifty, the fifty first or fifty second right now. So I, I have more than forty out on the shelves. Oh okay. my Thank this, God, this I'm is not like video. Be- <laughs> well, I was gonna say your eyes are like bugging out. They are. I, well, holy cow! I'm, yeah, I'm on 14 <clears throat> with my novellas. That's 14. How? How? Well, that, that's including novellas. I do have. There's like six or so of novellas cl- included but in that. Still, so. that's oh still a lot goodness. of books. That, that is a lot. Of almost books. 20 years. That's so, a lot. Of books. Okay. 
For those of you listening, we're recording through Squadcast. We can see each other, but thank God you can't see us. Because when Tracy said 40 to 50 books, Danny and I, our mouths just dropped down to the floor. That, yes. And how long of a span? So my first book came out in 2004. So I'm coming on roughly 20 years. 20 years, 40 to 50 books. Yeah. Two, it's two a year, more than two a year. Yeah, I started out with one a year, and then I went to two a year, <laughs> and now I'm like four, five. What? Six, a year? Like, yeah. It's, oh, my goodness. Well, That's crazy. Okay, keep in mind, during COVID, when all of us couldn't go to writing conferences, right? I needed something to do, so I just wrote. Oh, gosh. Wow. I probably wrote like an extra couple of books in there. Oh, that that's true. Yeah, I got published. My first book came out in 2012, but I still don't think if you add those extra years on, I, I wouldn't be anywhere near that. I do one a year, so I'm a slowpoke writer. But that's fabulous. No, you're, you're, you're normal. I just have problems sometimes. <laughs> I, like, I like that. I take it you're retired then. Um, so yeah, I, this is the okay. day job. Writing is my okay. day job. Full, full-time oh. job. So yeah. Yeah. I left the CIA back in 95. So in 95, I did. What'd you do, sir? Five years there? Six. Six years. Well, there you go. Well, is... So, okay. So you left the CIA and went right into writing and became yeah. a full-time author. Wow. That, yeah, I, it took a long time to get the first one written, but once but I started, then it faster. just kind of rolled th- forward. Yeah. So I am curious. Um, obviously, you're a fast writer. How long does it take you to write a book? Um, a rough draft, two to three months. Okay. Rough draft. So, and is and that then, what you turn in is the rough draft? Or is that with, re- like, before you actually send it in, it takes a little longer? So... Normally what I do is I get the rough draft and I'll read through it. I'll do like another mm-hmm. draft after that. And then I send, yep. I have to send my stuff to the CIA because of oh. my former employment. Okay. And during that month or so that they're clearing it, then I, um, then I go through and I polish a little bit more. And before mm-hmm. I, so usually it, it takes me a few weeks now. I mean, the big ch- difference is when I first started, it could take me a year or, you know, mm-hmm. later months. Uh-huh. to polish a manuscript now it takes me a couple of weeks wow so that's it oh t- my gosh so that's i take it your books are about your time in the cia then well i use things that i know from there which is okay. why they have to read my stuff <laughs> okay fair so, enough yeah and that's the other thing is research is huge i mean right you know i don't have to do a lot because it's just was my normal daily life uh-huh. where a lot of people would to go and be like, all right, how would I know this? And sure. And, and that's another place that co- writer writing conferences come in is that sometimes they'll have those like at Thriller Fest, they'll have somebody from the FBI there this year to say, all right, this yep. is how you would find information out, you know, things like that. Um, yeah. So, so I've got to ask really quick before we move on, because I'm still in awe that you write a book that fast. <laughs> do you, do you plot your books out or outline them or are you seated in the pants where you just start writing? I just start writing. I don't, I am yeah. probably the worst pantser on the planet. I, I put my fingers on the keyboard. And I'm like, I wonder what will happen today. Yeah. And I have no idea. I'm the same way. Wow. Okay. That's impressive because a lot of people I know that write quicker than I do, which is a lot of people, um, they usually outline or plot. And I'm like thinking maybe I could write faster if I do that, but that was an encouragement because it's good to know you can still just go and and do it faster so i mean i'm convinced that everyone has a certain way that works for them and yeah. they have to stick with that and sometimes exactly. it'll, it'll change between books you know like there's one that yeah. i did kind of plot out more a little bit uh-huh. i still think plot is a four-letter word that i shouldn't use exactly so, i'm with you, know. you on that that's what we call it we call it the four-letter word um, so you brought up Thriller Fest. So why don't you share yeah. a little bit about that for people who don't know? I love Thriller Fest, but you're about to go. So why don't you fill everybody in so, on that? Well, I haven't been yet. So this is one that's held in New York <gasps> really? and it's by the International Thriller Writers Organization. So you should tell me what I should oh, look forward to. Sure. I'm excited because so, it's in New York. 
Yes, it's always in New York, um, and it varies between May and July. Um, and I've gone probably, I try to go every other year or so. Um, I try to vary the conferences I go to, so I get something a little different each year. But um, so Thriller Fest is fabulous. They have so much. They have um, what's called a master class, which Tracy's participating in. And basically, you get assigned to a New York Times bestselling author for the day. And they work with you on what you're working on. And they teach you for like eight hours. I did it with um, Grant Blackwood, who writes with the Tom Clancy estate, Clive Kessler, mm. some of his own. It's amazing. Then, like she said, there's an FBI day you can sign up for where they teach you all day. Then they have Craft Fest, which is when you can learn different writing classes. Then they have Thriller Fest, which is more for readers. So they have authors sit on panels and they talk and readers can come and listen to them. And there's book signings. Um, they don't get a ton in for book signings, I think, just because of the nature of the venue um, and how they're set up. But, um, I mean, it's amazing what you learn from there, just sitting in and listening to different authors. And they're always so good about, like, putting people on panels. Like, I've always been on a panel or two, and it's been really fun. So it's uh, always in New York, which isn't that far from here, and it's definitely a worthwhile conference. And that's the Thriller Fest. Yep. That's for Thriller Fest, yeah. Yep. So, so if you write different... mystery or suspense or thriller or right. anything in that area it's good and I, you neither one of you could probably answer this but approximately how many different conferences do you think there are oh types, my gosh hundreds because i'm hundreds. sure you, if you have a thriller fest filler thriller fest jeez if you have a thriller fest i'm sure there's probably like a romance fest and stuff like oh, that. oh right? yeah there's different ones for every genre i'd say in our in the U.S. alone, there's probably, I would say, 300 if you add every single one up. I mean, two to 300 wow. probably. Yeah. At least. Yeah. At least. Yeah. And they range in size from small to really large. Um, right. So um, there is a fabulous local one. Um, I'm actually on the media relations team for it, and I'm very excited because it's in Columbia. It's called Creatures, oh. Crime, and Creativity. And it Ooh. is in September in Columbia. And so it's writers of fantasy, sci-fi, any kind of mystery, and then any other genre. And they have the best speakers in there. And you get to be on panels. And it's a decent enough size. You can kind of get to really know people at it. Right. Um, and they're hosting a huge book signing with like, 40 authors and like Jeffrey Deaver is one of the authors there. And so we're sharing about it because we know people would really like to come in and meet the authors and we're trying to make it more um, known in the area that that's going on. But it's a really good conference too. It's kind of like a mini thriller fest, I would say. Uh, it has mm -hmm. that feel of some craft, some kind of more reader focused. Um, it's very interesting. They have a lot of like right. FBI guys, that that type of thing. They come in there too. So the idea that I've been talking to you about that I want to do with local art authors, I'm doing wrong. I should look into doing a conference instead. Yeah. Possibly. Possibly, yeah. Huh. Yeah. That well, I know that because we actually have. I live in Stafford, Virginia, and. Down in Fredericksburg, we hold a local writers' conference. It's actually free to the public, but it's mostly for probably caters more towards newer writers. In right, fact, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Devers was our um, keynote last year. Oh, that fun! One's always, I think that one's I think November fourth this year, but it's always somewhere in that you know late fall. But um, but I think it, you know that's always a good place for people to look is look at your libraries because sometimes mm. they. They they host some writing events and everything, and then you you have the other ones that are bigger that, you know. They I mean I think the one I I keynoted at one last year that was almost nine hundred people, so it's yeah. a huge variance between like itty bitty tiny, you know, a few hundred people or even less, you know, fifty people or whatever to thousands. 
Yeah, so, that's so what, very true. So what are some of the benefits of attending one of these? Do you want to oh take it, Tracy? So <laughs> well, I, I think I think a lot of it is the networking. You know, right. it's like you get to know other people that think like you do. I mean, you know, we're walking around talking about these fictional characters like they're real and being with other people who don't think we're insane because of it. It's really refreshing. <laughs> Right. We get out of our office or, our, you know, the deadline cave and get a breathe and see other authors and they understand us. And it's a lot of fun. So I agree. Well, what with about that. an aspiring author? I mean, what's the benefits for an aspiring author? Oh, oh they're the huge. Thing, but also the craft. I mean, yeah. even even at our level, Danny and I both have, you know, a lot of books out, but you're still always trying to improve your craft. And right. so that. Any aspiring author, I think one of the things that I really, this is one of the reasons that took me so long to write that first book is you write the first time you're like, oh my gosh, I have a story and it's intact and it makes sense. And an editor will fix everything now. And it's like, "Mm, no, that's not really how it works. Uh -uh. You want to make, you know, how to write, not just tell a story. Or if you know how to write, make sure your story is something that's compelling enough for somebody to want to read. So I think that writers conferences can really help us find that balance of, all right, how much of this is, do I need to keep because it's my voice and how much do I need to change because I really can't improve and make it better. Right. Yeah. And I think aspiring authors, like I went to conferences when I was an aspiring writer and I took Mm -hmm. away so much. I learned craft skills, like Tracy's saying, Um, I met people in the industry. I, met my agent years before I signed with her. I hosted a workshop that she did and I met her and I love what she had to say. So years later when I signed with my editor and I sold, I decided that I wanted an agent at that point because I saw a contract and I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. So I knew that that's who I wanted. So I reached back out to her and I've been with her since. So you get to know people in the industry Um, and that can, you know, it's a small enough industry that that can really open doors when you are, have a genuine relationship with somebody, you're not trying to target, Ooh, let me get this agent. But, you know, if you get the opportunity to chat with them and as an aspiring author, you, most conferences have what they call pitch sessions where you can sit down and tell an editor or an agent about your book. And sometimes they buy it. And if you're new enough, sometimes you can just run ideas by them and, and, you know, get to know what they're like a little bit. So when you're further down the road, you have an idea. So um, aspiring writers, it's a great thing for them to do. So at these conferences, you have authors, agents, uh, editors. Are there like publishers and marketers there as well? Sometimes, depending on the conference. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, it's a- and a lot of t- a lot of the conferences I go to, there's actually a mix too, where you'll have people who have done really well in the self-publishing industry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so some of their classes on how they do marketing and analytics and things like that are fascinating and can kind of open up your understanding for that other side of things. So uh-huh. even if, like Danny and I are both traditionally published, but... Um, it's nice to know what the other side of it looks like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. That's a great point. That's true. Because conferences sometimes cater to traditional, sometimes to self-published. And then you get the ones that do both. Um, and mm-hmm. actually, the book that I have coming out next week on Tuesday um, was is an indie published book. Um, my publishers, I was contracted for a three-book series. All... Like, I can't tell you how many readers emailed me and asked to see this couple, Logan and Emmy. Is there a book four? Is there a book four? Is there a book four? So I went back to my publishing house and they're like, you're already on the next four book contract. But if you want to do a short story or a novella, you can do that. So they, they gave me permission and it was super fun and, um, comes out next week. I'm excited about, but the cool thing was, is I had so many friends help me. And I think they knew how to help me because they'd been to conferences and set in on those classes. And Tracy's right. There's stuff I learned through the indie process I can apply to traditional publishing marketing. Um, so that can be really helpful. Huh. Yeah. So somebody that's not an aspiring writer, author, like me, although I, that is one of my goals to start writing a book this year. Um, <laughs> but I love 
talking to other authors would it i mean would it be beneficial for me to go to something like this as well oh i guess for the networking part especially right i don't know but yeah. an author may look at me like i got two heads because i'm not an author <laughs> No, you know what they do at some of the conferences? They have people like media people who come in and do articles or interviews or okay. podcasts. Like you could even come in as a media person doing podcasts at a conference and people can sign oh, wow. up. Yeah. Depending on the conference, if it's a larger one, they usually will have people um, come in and you can sign up for slots with this podcast or this, you know, article or this, you know, interview. Um, and yeah, it'd be a good way to help authors out and get to know people. Huh. I think yeah. a lot of it is just choosing the right one, you know, choose yeah. the conference that has those opportunities. Cause some of them, they're just not going to, they're only going to be aspiring authors. You're not going to have a whole lot of people to network with and other ones. It's going to be like, Oh my gosh, Sorry, guys, I'm full. I can't take any more people to talk yeah. to. I can give so you a list. La what's the largest ones you guys have been to? How many people? I think the largest one I've been to so far was Storymakers out in Utah. It's every May. Um, and that one usually runs about 900. 900. Okay. The largest one I've been to was years ago. I went to Rom uh, Romance Writers of America it was my first conference and it was like 1200 people. And I was like, so intimidated because I mean, wow. all these authors that I read were there. It's my very first one. And I was like, I picked the biggest one in the world one in the States to go to <laughs> for the first time. So that was a little overwhelming, but uh, yeah, that, that one runs or at least has run, you know, 1200 and higher. So yeah. And I think that one, one piece of advice I would give is when you're first, if you haven't gone to conferences before, if you're an aspiring author is go to a smaller one first, uh -huh. because then you don't feel like there's a um, Midwest story makers in Kansas city. I go to, I usually teach at every year and that one's runs between 50 and 150. So it's a smaller one and you walk uh -huh. out of there knowing everyone, but like every agent that, you know, we usually have editors rather than agents there, but uh -huh. you walk, walk out knowing everybody's name and they know, yeah. you, you know, so it's a really good networking sometimes to go to some of those smaller ones. And I know Danny, you're going to, was it James Ryder? James River Ryder? Yes. Yeah. It's the one down in Hampton, um, near Virginia beach. And I'm going to do a keynote and teach some classes there, um, which I'm really excited about. I think it's going to be a, a good experience. And I agree with you. I think smaller ones can be really beneficial, um, for aspiring and for, you know, um, right. Authors that are further along more so in right. talking, I guess, and teaching. Um, but yeah. there's still, you know, benefits for that giving back and networking and seeing friends. And Thriller Fest will actually be the first time I've ever gone to a conference that I didn't teach at. Really? The first conference I, in fact, the first class I ever went to at a writer's conference is the one I taught. And my editor and managing editor were both in the room. I'm like, I'm going to die. <laughs> like, this is wow. crazy. I was like, maybe six books in. I'm like, I have no idea what this is supposed to look like. And, you know, oh. but it, it, I survived and think yeah. that I did, did okay and enough to get invited back. So that was good. But yeah, so so you're it's going to be really different, different situation. Yes. So you're not going to be speaking on a panel or anything. You're just going to learn. So, yeah, I mean, I'm on one panel for there something about top secret or something. It's an no. espionage type panel. <laughs> Shocking. Cool. But that's the one I always get tossed on. Yeah. That but that, that'll be good. So yeah. Interesting for, I think you'll really like it. They do a great job. Yeah. So Tracy, when you go to these things, now you already said with your books, you have to, they yet send them to the CIA first for them to approve. But how's that go when you're at a writer's conference, especially if you're on the panel or you're a keynote speaker? I mean, because somebody could ask you a question. I mean, that that's got to be kind of hairy. How do you? It, it is. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things that usually when I start a class, if it has anything to do with intelligence, because I actually taught one last year that was um, kind of the what people get wrong in the CIA. Right. And so... 
I had talked to the CI public or uh, the CI public affairs group, and you know, used my notes from there. And everything I put on my slides because I didn't have time to throw every send everything through them. So I pulled everything off of public source and I just told everyone at the beginning of the class, I'm like, first of all, no recordings. I'm like, typically story makers records their classes and you can watch them for like a, a month mm. afterward. I was like, we're not recording this class. If you're not in the room. You're not here. You're not getting it. Right. But I said, there will be questions that I cannot answer. And so I'm sorry. If, if you push me past my security clearances, I'm going to have to say, sorry, I can't answer that right. question. Or mm -hmm. you don't want to die today, so you know, <laughs> don't make me try to kill you. So that was, and and I'm going to have another one <laughs> that is going to be this year. It's um, taking the, going to the rest of the intelligence community. So, so and I've already been like I need to still talk to DIA, but like I've already talked to the FBI, and you know I've got my notes from the CIA. And it's also like, what have I done? What has changed since I was in? Because I worked, right. I worked when when I was in the agency, I worked for two years in the liaison group. For, um, which was basically working with all the other government agencies. And so since I worked with everyone else in intelligence, it's, you know, it's not hard for me to talk to what they do, mm -hmm. but I still have to make sure that, all right, what's classified? What, can, what, what are you telling me I can say so that I'm not putting myself in a spot? So, so uh, yeah, I have to do a lot more prep work than people realize before I step into one of those. And I'm I'm a little nervous about the panel, quite honestly, because I'm like, how much am I going to have to say? Sorry, I'm not sure if that's classified. I can't right. answer that question. You know what? I've been in panels like that, not on the panel, but listening, and they're they will flat out say, "I'm sorry, I can't answer that question." But I will yep. say, and they'll share something they can, so people right. respect that very highly. I think and understand. Yeah, yeah. So you all can right, always Tracy, make a I joke to... of it. You know, I can tell you, but oh. then I'll have to kill you. I mean, that usually will come out of my mouth at some point. <laughs> Are you getting ready to go away, but you don't know what to do with your pet? You know, your neighbor down the street or that high school kid across the street may not be the ideal choice to look after your pet. And you have my sympathy. That's a job for your pet au pair. For complete relaxation while you're gone, hire a trained pet specialist. Of course, they're animal lovers. However, the health and security of your pet is their number one concern. Furthermore, they make it ridiculously simple to get in touch with them since they respect your time. Your pet au pair is always quick to react to your needs. They're fear-free certified and they are a certified professional pet sitter. Call Nicole Wilson of your pet au pair. 410-989-1533. Again, that's 410-989-1533 or go to Bel Air All Pair. That's A-U-P-A-I-R dot com. They're doing it for the sits and wiggles. I have to ask you this because <laughs> before you came on, when Danny told me CIA, I, I this has just been bugging me. How in the world... Did you get into the CIA? I mean, was it out of college or? Yeah. And, and that was your goal. You wanted to go into the CIA. No. Oh, I mean, okay. I thought it was interesting. <laughs> I, so, so basically my husband's from Alexandria, Virginia. So okay. it was like, I told him, I said, look, we need to live. I'm from Arizona. We need to live on one side of the country or the other. I don't want to do this, live in the middle and have to always be traveling to see family. Right. So, um, my husband already had a job as a civilian with the Coast Guard that he knew he could come into. But um, when we were in college, I ran into one of the people he went to church with um, was a recruiter at, at the college I was at. And he's like, Tracy, you should come interview. And I was like, all right, they were looking for accountants. I'm a finance person, like right. counting hundreds of thousands of dollars versus pennies. Hmm, which one would I rather <laughs> play with? So I don't really love, I mean, pennies are nice to collect, but not to count. So I, um, anyway, he's like, I don't care if you're doing accounting, just, you know, I've got an opening and it's like four o'clock or whatever, come, come back. And so I came back and I ended up being one of the two people they, they took that year from my recruiting, um, class. So cool. wait a minute. So they came to you and recruited you. Yeah. Didn't that scare you at all? <laughs> 
you know, I was too naive to think that way at, okay. that, at the time. Now I'd be like, what? How did I know? You know, how do you know me or whatever? But I mean, I, he knew that I had some language skills. I did at the time. I was pretty fluent in Spanish, and um, and I didn't. I accidentally created like the perfect degree for what I ended up doing. So I, I, I graduated in finance, but I also did international business with a minor in international relations. Oh. And then I also had business computers as my other minor. So I'm like, I go in yeah. and they're like, you're perfect okay, for you, it. You literally are a perfect fit. Hey, they so, ever looking for any podcast host? <laughs> I don't know. You know, you have to talk. They do have that group though. The, it was the publication classification review board that reads books all day long to make sure that my stuff doesn't have any secrets in it. That's so. crazy. So that's her job. Really? They do that for authors. That's a I job. Mean, every author. Really? Well, they just, they have to go through anyone who's currently CIA or anyone who has, is writing about anything in the intelligence community if they're former CIA. So what are so, they called? So like, Book review? The, they just changed their name. The, the Publication Classification Review Board. <laughs> that's so. crazy. Oh my goodness. That's, that's a job. So, um, and, I mean, it was be- really funny. I was in Idaho last week for a book tour and um, I was staying with my cousin and I was like, yes, I just got an email from the CIA. I'm cleared. And she goes, that is something I never thought I would hear in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here she's in rural Idaho. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like That's this is, funny. This happens a few times a year for me. So yeah. I don't know. You, I'm telling you, I think Danny is trying to get me in trouble or something because the <laughs> author's podcast, round, roundtable podcast we did, FBI came up a few times. And then she, 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 she invites you on CIA. I'm like, I never did yeah. anything bad in the military. So, yeah. uh, or even after. <laughs> right. Yeah. We were talking about like my research, my internet search and uh-huh. flags that might come up and doing all the paperwork to go through the FBI so you can ask them questions. And he was like, all right, we got the feds. Now we got CIA. Now, yeah, I'm trying to get him in trouble. We'll see what else we can get on, right? Yeah. DIA. How, yeah. How to, what was it? NSA. What was it th- oh, how to, how to bury a body. Oh yeah, is what the research was <laughs> like. It was. It was. God, the best this thing is going to be flagged <laughs> at Gettysburg. So yeah, um, yeah. Just this, research. This is our normal life. It is right. I, this is so normal for, I mean, yeah. it's so much how we think. I was actually on a plane one time and I'm sitting there, I'm in the middle of writing like one of those types of scenes where there might be a dead body in it. And um, I was on one of those flights where it stops in the in, at an airport and people get off and other people get on, but I was staying on the plane Dang. the whole time. And so they're going and doing that little count through for the on the plane. And they clearly were off by a number. And I, and so the person comes through and counts again. And they're still off. I said, you're missing bodies in the, in, probably in the restroom. Somebody went in there. And the person across from me, like their jaw drops, like <laughs> missing body. And I'm like, I mean, the person, the missing person, <laughs> they're living, they're breathing. I'm just, they're in the bathroom. So, now, what if it had been a body? Then, you know, I mean, that could have been pretty And I would have had, I, I can pass a polygraph. I'm just saying. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was telling Rich, I got so excited. I had a new research book and I was all excited. It's a death handbook, uh, investigating ooh. deaths and, you know, what the whole process they go through. See, ooh, that's, and I said, those are the books we get excited about. And he was like, yeah, I know. So, but yeah, it's actually a really good book. So uh, I'll pass along the full title to you if you're interested. So, of course. Well, Tracy, wow. I would love to know about how many writer conferences or retreats, all that, do you attend a year? Do you? Ooh, I'm probably up to about, let's see, one, two, three, four, probably like five or six. Okay. So, and you yeah. teach at all of them for the most part, right? So, you're teaching yeah, at one. Of them. I do one writer's retreat that's just, we go down to North Carolina with a few people Mm -hmm. and we just write. We might do like a little mini class every evening or something and just take turns, Mm -hmm. but that's just a focus on we're being productive, we're getting words on the page. Yeah. Um, Yeah, the most of them, most of the time I teach. So there's three stable ones that I, or four four that I consistently Mm -hmm. teach at, so. Okay. Which one? This year I'll be usually. 
Which ones do you usually um, teach at? There's a one in um, usually in the East Valley in Mesa, like Mesa, Phoenix area, um, uh -huh. Arizona. Oh, so that one's called there. American Night Riders Association. Oh. So that one's September time frame. And then the Midwest Storymakers Conference in Kansas City is in the fall. I'm mm -hmm. heading out to Storymakers in Utah um, next week. Mm -hmm. And then, or a week, week and a half from now. And then, um, and then the Rappahannock Regional Library, which is the oh. local one I mentioned here in, in Virginia. Right. So, okay, that's cool. I love that we are. So and then I keep naming, You're naming conferences so, I've never been to, so that's super fun right. to know we both have different conferences and that we've been to. Yeah. So. And I want to do the one up in Columbia. I, I don't know if the time will work you this year, to. but I keep thinking. Like, that's going to be one I need to put on my yes. like early yeah. on the schedule so it doesn't get bumped. Yeah, well, it's a really great a conference. Hmm? What, Rich? How, no, how many do you do a year, Danny? Oh, me? Um, I usually do I usually do a writing retreat with a friend where we just write. And then I right. hold r r two retreats I teach at. So I usually go to at least one conference a year, um, sometimes two. And then I usually go to a trade show. So, for example, uh, Christian Product Expo is where uh -huh. all the independent bookstore owners come for Christian mm -hmm. fiction. And my publisher will send me and I do interviews and I sign books for them. And it's to get you to know the independent bookstore owners um, specifically for Christian fiction. So that's in August. Right. So I'll go to that. So I'm probably at five or six things. It's just different types of things. So, oh, um, yeah. yeah. Yep. For independent bookstore earners. Yeah. For Christian independent That's something bookstore. We, yeah. That's something we need more of. Cause there's not a lot of independent bookstores. I know so many there closed. Aren't. It's like as much as we can support them. I want to support them. You know, it's mm -hmm. just, they struggle, I think. And, and it's a shame. So, um, I love independent bookstores. There's several in the area I, I go to. Like, there's one in Annapolis that's great, and there's one up in uh, Chadsford, Pennsylvania that's great. And so, visiting those is a great way to support them. Right. Now, yeah. Tracy, with you in your area, how many conferences are there that are close to you, r roughly a year? Mm. I mean, there's, I think there's might be one in DC area, okay. but I, pretty much it's um, just the one that's here locally that, and that was one I actually helped found. Um, I was running one out in Kansas city and we turned it over to the library and I basically went to my librarian and I was like, Hey, we should be doing this. And uh, cool. we got, we partnered up with her, her name's Joy O'Toole. She's a, um, she was helping, she works at the library, but she was helping run some of the local writer groups you know, okay. critique groups. And so the two of us and um, one of the managers, local branch managers got together and were like, let's just make this happen. So, and it's amazing. It's like, you know, all the people who teach, they're just doing it out of the kindness of their heart. They're not mm -hmm. getting paid or anything. It was just, it's really just to give back, but mm -hmm. it's just a single Saturday. We did a, a few classes last time that were more intensive, you know, one-on-one -on -one type of stuff um, last year for the Friday night beforehand. But but it's kind of cool because they also have like a teen track. Mm -hmm. So some of the local teenagers can come in and know that they can go to classes that are only for teenagers. And so, it, yeah. you know, they tend to be a little bit more willing to ask questions and interact if they're mm -hmm. not dealing with. There's a mm -hmm. bunch of adults here that could be my grandparents, you know. Yeah. So, so that's anyway. awesome. So that's probably the only with, one really local, but that's and, awesome and with, with us, the chain track. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And with us, Danny, the closest one is Columbia. Well, there's one in Columbia that is great. And then there, I think that the closest one is the Columbia one there. There's wow. a couple in Pennsylvania, um, lower Pennsylvania that are not too far, like Philadelphia area. Right. Um, and there's, a. Uh, another one i'm not sure exactly where it is in pennsylvania and then there's one in virginia um american christian fiction writers virginia chapter has a really great conference in november every year um, is that one down in richmond is that where that one is that one is actually in northern virginia okay. it's um yeah like i was a keynote at it a few years ago and it was held 
um, in, I forget where it wasn't a part of Northern Virginia I was familiar with. And I grew up in Northern Virginia, so it was a little outside of it. Um, but it was really, really fun. So yeah, there's, there's, I probably within an hour, hour and a half drive, there's probably five or six of them, but I'd say Columbia is the closest one. Um, and it's for oh writers God, of like every it. genre. So I think that's cool that anybody can go, yeah. you know what I mean? And get something out of it. Yeah. We definitely yeah. have to change that though. <laughs> yes. Agreed. Need to get, need to get one here. And need make to it start a conference. To, yes. And make it interesting enough to where Tracy would say, Ooh, I'm going to drive up there and be a part of that. There you go. There we go. You guys, if you're going to be there, of course I'd come. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, what what are some of the common mistakes that writers make when attending a conference? Ooh, good question. I think the biggest mistake, and this is something I normally will point out in all my classes, is do not take anything as law. Because everyone has different ways of writing and stuff. Mm -hmm. And some of you can share their method and say, this is how you should do something. And there's always an exception to the rule. And sometimes it's not going to fit. So you really have to take take in all the information and figure out what works for you. And that's what you want to walk away with. Hmm. I agree 100%. What, other, what resonates with you, you keep. And what doesn't, you let go of. So that's great advice to give, Tracy. That's great. Yeah, Tracy, I would say... Said, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Danny. No, no, no. I was just going to say the mistake that I see at conferences is people being too kind of targeting ed editors and agents like they will ah. you know that's their sole purpose is i'm going to find one and sit down and pitch to them and so they'll get them in the elevator and they'll pitch to them and true story i know the editor that's happened to mm. she she went in the restroom and somebody slid their proposal under the stall to give to her in the restroom yeah, that would have yeah. gone down the toilet if that was me. It, yeah, she never looked at it. But, I mean, some people go and they're like, I have to talk. And they are people, too. You know, they need some space. They need time to yeah. do their thing. And if you get an appointment, that's great when you talk to them. If they happen to sit at your table, you can talk to them. Just don't hunt them, I think, is the best way to put it. You know what I mean? When you have those yeah. opportunities. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dan. I'm turning it back over to you now. No, I, no. I'm just intrigued by all of this. No, um, I was going to say, Tracy, I know that we've talked, I think, about this too, but there are a lot of virtual conferences that people can attend. Oh. Yeah. Are there any in particular that you really like, or have you done much with virtual conferences? I mean, most of the ones I do have the virtual element. So like Storymakers mm -hmm. has a virtual side as well. Okay. Um, and then I think, I think the Midwest one does also. So, I mean, those are great when you don't want to travel. Mm -hmm. I do think there's, it's great if you just want content, especially if you're just a newer mm -hmm. writer and you, you, you know, you want to learn, but you're not quite sure how, you know, how much you want to invest in, mm -hmm. in traveling, making those connections and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and especially if you don't have a finished manuscript, it can be really hard you know, like, do I really want to pay to go across the country for some conference mm -hmm. and pay for hotels and everything when I'm not going to be able to pitch anyway. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, I think sometimes that's the best time to go because you're, mm -hmm. you, you can get to know people without any pressure. Like there's yes. it's not, oh, I need to know you because you can help my career. It's like, you know, the people who you get to know that you don't care what they can do for your career. Those yes. are the people who are going to be your friends for that are going to last. Exactly. That's totally so. well spoken. I agree. It's either the natural connections you make rather than the formal, you know, pitches of this and that. So I think right. the virtual ones really happened over COVID and several, yeah. it went well for them. So they're staying with the virtual platform. And then, like you said, some are doing a hybrid. So you can do yeah. some virtual and some in person, um, but you're right. I think it's a great way if you are trying to learn the craft and you don't want to invest, you know, a thousand, whatever, fifteen hundred dollars right. to go to a conference. Um, it's a good way to to learn and to get uh, places, conferences you wouldn't be able to fly across country for or whatever. So, right. um, 
Yeah. And then, um, so one of the funnest conferences I've been to, it's not really a conference per se, but is the Writers Police Academy. Have you been to that, Tracy? I haven't. This is its last year. I'm so sad. It's the best experience. I've been twice. You go and they let you, like, I actually got to go. They have buildings and they taught us how to break, like break in the door and clear the room. So I went in with two authors, Terry Blackstock and Lisa Gardner. And Terry got in there and hid. She was the murderer. And Lisa and I had to clear the place. And Lisa looked on the balcony to the left. She did not look to the right. And Terry Blackstock killed us. But it was a really fun experience knowing how to. So I always say Terry Blackstock killed me. So, um, yeah. But they let you do. I mean, they they have uh, Kathleen Ramsland, who is uh, Kathleen Ramsland, who's like this foremost forensic psychologist. They teach you about tread marks and how to do you know pull tread marks and dna and it's amazing it's i think this year it might be in august but i'm not sure it's up in wisconsin it used to be north carolina so it's a little harder to get to but if you have the time since this last one it's a great a great one to go to yeah that's good to how know. many people go to that about roughly <laughs> That's a good question. I would say there's probably some, I'm bad with numbers, but I'm going to say somewhere around 150, maybe it's not huge. Um, I think that they limit it because you can only have so many per class and they alternate mm -hmm. classes. Um, but yeah, it's really reasonable. And you just, I've learned, like I saw them go through to, to, um, uh, turn uh, this is not the right word turn off a bomb deactivate a bomb and they mm -hmm. actually had this little bomb go off instead and showed what happened when that happened and you can do the fireman thing up all the ladders for the training tower and it's amazing what they have so that's like been the most fun conference i've been to um do you have a super fun one tracy boy i don't know i mean all of them have like different strengths and mm -hmm. stuff yeah, um, I I have to say probably Storymakers is one of my favorites simply because um, I've I've been going for so many years that it's it's like going home and seeing all your friends. So that's, that's always nice. a lot of fun. And yeah. they have um, my my publisher typically does, you know, like has some events in concert with mm -hmm. that one. So that's that's probably one of my favorites. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I, I have a special place in my heart for the one locally because it's just. Being you able started to put out a free a free conference for people who are just trying to start out and see what they can do and they and we do have like a few virtual classes it's only a handful mm -hmm. but but it's still mm -hmm. nice to know that those are out there so that's great yeah, i think it's great you see. have a free one that's amazing yeah how hard yeah. was that to start um believe it or not it really wasn't that bad okay <laughs> because because I had already run conference, like I'd chaired conferences before. Mm -hmm. And so we took, you know, the, the library, when we first started, the library is like, well, we'll just use our space. So we didn't have to pay for any place to be. Right. And we weren't really use didn't have much as far as needing a budget. You know, a couple of local companies pitched in and gave us like folders and pens and some things like that. And then, um, and I was like, well, I can find you, find you authors. And the library was already very well connected. So we just brought in a few people, did a few classes, and then it's just kind of grown into more classes each year. So, wow. So, yeah, that's... It's, it's mostly just knowing how to do it. Like, all right, this is what, this is what you need. This is what an author is going to need to set up having the library staff willing to, to do the audiovisual and that side of things. But I mean, quite honestly, it's probably going to get harder because library staffs are getting so cut back right mm -hmm. now. And I think that's happening across the country where, um, they provide a really valuable service to us, but unfortunately that's one of the easy places to take money from. And that yeah. was free for the writers that were taking part and the people coming to it? Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. I love that. Yep. That's great. Huh. Yeah. So I'm curious because you, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, one of the things I found very interesting was when I we first started the conference, I was the only, I think I was the only person who was, a, who was presenting, who stayed for the entire conference. 
And mm. the others, others were like, oh, well, I'm an author. And so I'm, I'm here to teach and didn't take into account that they would actually be able to learn too. So it's been interesting to see how it's progressed that, oh, wait, now all the presenters are like, I should stay for the whole thing because I could learn something for some of these mm. other people. So well, that's on, great. On average, how long do these last, the conference? So that one's just a single day uh, conference. Most of the ones I go to are like, two days and then maybe they'll have a workshop day as well but like thriller oh, wow. fest it's almost the whole week it is if you add all of the pieces because it's like there's a master class on one day and then there's the um, fbi the day half... yeah i don't know if they have the f i don't remember if there's an fbi day or if it's just the fbi has classes in it but, wow. but anyway yeah. But yeah you have these different days that are specific um for for different things so you have like two days of the craft fest and two days of the thriller fest so I mean, it's like five, six days by the time it's all done. And God, you can choose to go to part so of it. You can do like right. two days of it. You can do craft fest and then not do thriller. I mean, it's great to go to everything. If you can do it, I highly recommend right. everything. But And right. most of the conferences I go to are about three days. Um, yeah. Like they'll start like wow. on a Thursday night and they'll end like on a Sunday morning, something like that. So, so it's it's basically just like your all your other things, like Comic Con and all that. Then, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So, Tracy, I'm curious because you teach at Story Makers. Um, do you have certain classes that you per, like enjoy teaching the most, or do you? Is it like long sessions, or is it single classes? You know, continuing ed. So or usually, single? yeah. So usually, it's like a 50 minute class. Um, and so uh, you have a couple of intensives that might be like a two hour intensive class, but typically it's a, a 50, 50 minute mm -hmm. class. But, um, I honestly, I, I, I do enjoy the ones that have to do, you know, where I can kind of use some of my expertise and background and stuff, but mm -hmm. probably one of my favorite ones to teach, I call it, um, creativity on a deadline. And it's literally kind Ooh. of the pep talk of how do you make deadlines? How do you get yourself to actually create? Um, consistently, you know, when you're oh. basically avoiding writer's block. And it's been fun because that's one that no matter how long somebody's been writing, we all kind of sometimes will struggle with those aspects of, you know, my, my daily schedule is changing and I haven't quite figured out how to fit everything in that I need to and still get the production that I need. And so that's been a really fun class to teach. That's one I enjoy. I need that class. <laughs> I have to find that no, class. <laughs> seriously, I need to find, is it on tape? Like, or mp3 can you like buy it from story makers do they sell that it's i don't think it's on there but you and i can we'll do lunch <laughs> okay that, that can be my lunch in class because i that but we'll do that. a lunch class that's a great <laughs> class i've never heard anything on that so that's great yeah so Good it's class. a fun one yeah very cool I have to get you on another podcast anyways now to talk about your books which of course is going to have to co-host as well Sure. I would so, love that. I, mean, so. I, right. I love talking to different authors, but I've never had anybody on that's written 40 to 50 books. Yeah. I, I will I, count them. I, I, I think I'm at I'm 43. Oh, my goodness. Plus. Well, 43 on the shelves. Plus, you have audio books of them. I do. Uh, I've already yeah. gone. I've already went on to Amazon and looked. It's like. <laughs> Oh my God, this woman's got several pages. On yeah. her side. Do either of you have anything to add besides your websites? Uh, I don't think so, except I have a book coming out on Monday, May 2nd, uh, The Shifting Current, which I'm really excited about. And Tracy has an uh, upcoming release, and we're going to do some fun things together to celebrate them. So, yeah. Tracy, why don't you share your title of your book that's coming out? So Covert Ops will be coming out on May 9th. So very excited about that one. But yeah, Danny and I, check out check out our social media pages because on Instagram and Facebook because we will have a lot of fun and some kind of a, it's yeah. kind of more of an interactive um, giveaways. And yep. stuff. So we'll and it'll launch on Monday, right? May 1st is when it's launching. Yeah, so we're super right. excited about that. Yeah. And what's your websites? So I'm... Okay. Uh, TracyAbramson.com. It's Tracy and that, with an I. Okay. And, I'm and Danny? Danny Petri.com. 
You know, everybody that listens to this should have yours memorized by now. (laughs) (laughs) And just search our names on like Facebook and and Instagram. I mean, I'm Danny Petri on Facebook and author Danny Petri on Instagram. Um, And Tracy's under her names. And yeah, we have a lot of fun stuff launching on Monday. So it'll be, you'll want to get on to that, I think. Definitely. Well, ladies, I want to thank you so much. Tracy, it was a true honor to meet you. And um, thank you for not asking me to take a polygraph or anything. <laughs> thank you for having me. Now you've been warned. This yeah. is why you didn't want me in person. I know. I know. See, I know Danny was setting me up. I still think she is, too. Yeah, I'll see who else I can find. I was just going to say, she said, she's, next thing she's going to tell me is, hey, Rich, I do have somebody from the FBI that, that would like to come on. Yeah, the, it might happen. I'll see what I can You don't know anybody in the FBI, do you? Not yet. Yes. Oh, God, she wait, does. I forgot you. Right? Tra- okay, never mind. Jeez. I'm like, she, was, she knows I'm everybody. I'm Mr. Quantico. FBI Academy's up the road. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Please. Check out the show notes for all the relevant links for my guests. All you have to do is go to conversationswithrichbennett.com and you'll see the show notes in this episode. And if you can, please leave a review for the podcast as well. Meanwhile, check out the trailer for this podcast that I highly recommend. Welcome to our first episode of Between the Lines, a podcast for readers and writers. I'm Tracy Hunter Abramson, and I'm here with Sean and Bessie, Esther Hatch, and Sarah M. Eden. So I write romantic suspense, and I secretly love to write, well, okay, so I should tell you, I write romantic suspense because I write what I know, and I know the CIA. I secretly spend way too much time reading the CIA World Factbook and old case files from the FBI. And I'm Sean Ann Bessie, and I grew up in Wales, which is why you might catch a slight accent every once in a while on this podcast, particularly if the words tomato and garage are mentioned. (laughs) Um, I write historical romance, romantic suspense, and I've also written some children's books. And I think that the variety of books that I write is indicative of my reading choices because I love variety. I'm Esther Hatch, and I write historical romance. Um... And some of my favorite things to read are actually fantasies, but I also love romance. Anything with a romance in it, I will read. (laughs) And I'm Sarah M. Eden. I write historical romance and historical fiction. Not because I write what I know, like Tracy, but because I write what I aspire to know. (laughs) And I'm still learning. Um, I secretly love to read contemporary romance, even though I can't write it. And I love to read poetry, which I also can't write. But I'm going to let um, the ladies here in on a little secret. I have a talent for writing bios, not for myself, but for other people. And I would like to share with you bios I've written for all of you. (laughs) Prepare yourselves to be amazed. Tracy Hunter Abramson secretly dreams of writing heavily researched historical fiction and wearing shoes on every possible occasion. Despite rumors to the contrary, she does in fact make pie crusts. Okay, so I actually can make a pie crust, but I'm sitting here (laughs) with no shoes on, and if it's not including a Google search, I'm not doing the research. (laughs) I still feel like that was accurate. Uh, Let's see if I did better with Esther. Esther, here's the bio I wrote for you. Esther Hatch is a card-carrying member of the 3% of romance authors who actually enjoy writing (laughs) kissing scenes. She researches these scenes extensively, much to the delight of her husband. (laughs) Esther has never written a hero who wasn't swoony, and she never will. Find her work wherever swoony kissing books are sold. <laughs> I love it. I guess I do write what I know. I was thinking, actually, now that you say that. Yeah. We should ask her husband if she writes what she knows. All right. Okay, Sean, here's what I have for you. I'm ready. Sean and Bessie speaks Welsh, bakes better than most people's mothers, and writes unputdownable stories, making her a solid triple threat. Her name rhymes with fawn, 
not cyan, and does not sound at all like pecan. It is the life mission of her many friends and loved ones to make certain that people know this. That's true. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's, per- that's perfect. But I think that we should explain, since this is a podcast, that my name is spelled S-I-A-N, which is why... <laughs> All of those wonderful varieties are out there. <laughs> I think I called you CM for the first, like, two years I knew you until I heard you say your name, and then I was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Welsh for Jane, and in Wales it's a, it's a fairly common name, and I always tell people Sean, like Sean Connery, which is S-E-A-N, is Irish for John. They're both Gaelic root mm-hmm. names. Right. Yeah. So there you go. We've all been educated. And because I didn't want to be the only person without a bio, I wrote one for myself. Let's see how well I know me. (laughs) Sarah M. Eden used to be a person. (laughs) Now she stays up late into the night, eating jam straight from the jar, and instead of writing books, she dreams of being in Ireland. Okay, the dreaming to be... And being in Ireland, that is so you. <laughs> That's right. that is so on, you. right? Yeah. So I actually didn't know people ate jam out of the jar. Right? Is that? It is a delicacy <laughs> in my household. <laughs> <laughs> we, won't, fact, we won't ask how big the spoon is. Yeah. We, just, we won't go there. Whenever I make jam and you know, we put it in jars, I have a little jar that's just for me. That's my jam jar. Because well, I really like it. Okay, it all makes sense now because you make the jam. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> that, that's totally acceptable. Then. Homemade jam, <laughs> totally different. But I felt bad that you had to write your own bio, so I actually wrote one for you oh, as dear. well. So we'll see how I did for Sarah's. So Sarah M. Eden writes kissing books, a lot <laughs> of kissing books, which is surprising considering she would rather not describe exactly how the whole kissing thing works. <laughs> She also writes heartfelt novels, many of which bring her back to her roots to Ireland. Her hair is really is red. She really might be smaller than not yet grown children, <laughs> but her humor, wit, and historical knowledge surpasses even the most refined of devo- adults. <laughs> I like how Esther's like bio for me is actually kind. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she's trying to give you a hint Got of what it. you should do she's in the like, future. Step up your game, but no, you're right. I'm very short. Very redheaded and very Irish. And so I feel like that's pretty accurate. There we go. There, yeah. Well, you probably already can see how deep our friendship is. And we know each other well enough to write each other's bios. And sharing that friendship with you is one of the reasons we decided to start this podcast. So in our different episodes, we'll be talking about friendship, life, and all things writing and reading. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Between the Lines Podcast. Thanks for being here and join us next time on Between the Lines. I want to share an amazing experience I had with Tar Hill Construction Group when I needed to install a new roof on my home. Let me tell you, they are truly a cut above the rest. Tar Hill Construction Group is an award-winning residential and commercial roofing and exteriors contractor focusing on roofing, siding, gutters, and solar solutions. Proudly serving Baltimore, Harford, and Cecil counties, they make it their priority to make a positive impact in the communities they serve first while providing exceptional services in roofing and exteriors. From start to finish, Tar Hill Construction Group proved to be a reputable and dependable contracted solution. Their quality installations and good communication kept me informed and reassured throughout the entire process. It's no wonder they have been voted Harford's best roofing contractor and best home improvement contractor for three years running. But here's what really impressed me. Tar Heel Construction Group's commitment to continued service and registered warranties. They stand behind their work, ensuring that I have peace of mind for years to come. What's even more remarkable is their dedication to giving back to the community. They aggressively support and uplift the neighborhoods they serve, making a positive difference in people's lives. I feel incredibly grateful and humbled to have chosen Tar Heel Construction Group for my roof. They have earned my trust and respect for being the only contractor to be voted Harford's best roofing contractor and Baltimore's best roofing contractor in the same year. So if you're looking for top-notch roofing and exterior solutions, look no further than Tar Heel Construction Group. 
Visit their website at tarheelconstructiongroup.com or give them a call at 410-638-7021. Again, that's 410-638-7021. Experience the excellence and community impact for yourself. Tar Hill Construction Group, building excellence one roof at a time. 